All right, my friends, welcome back to the channel today. I don't know if you've been keeping up to speed and following everything going on with the food crisis around the world, but what I decided to do this week was to spend a little bit more time on bedtime reading in terms of looking if we can find some more sort of cyclical patterns on this, some much longer and deeper historical patterns as to not the food destruction side, which we know is going off via the WEF and some of these other three-letter organizations, these big groups, not looking at the destruction side from, from that point of view, but also looking at the natural side, so looking at droughts and famines and the like. And very fascinating what I've discovered, which is something that even with my background and how much I love to read history, I didn't actually realize just how prevalent floods and, well, mainly drought, it's not necessarily as much flooding, but mainly drought and how impactful these have been over the years. And not just that, I was always taught at school whenever, you know, this was a discussion about drought and the impact it had on crops and food. It was as if it happens, you know, once in a blue moon, if you get that expression in your country, you know, thousands of years, you know, it's not a big deal. It doesn't happen all the time. But actually, now that I've been studying it a lot more, I've been looking at the periods of ancient Egypt, been looking at Angkor Wat, which is in Siam Reap, Cambodia, what actually caused, what was one of the reasons, there's multiple, what, what caused all of those people to just abandon this fantastic uh, city where the world had never seen anything like it during those times. And when you start connecting all these dots, you start to see a lot of it is to do with drought. Now, another thing I want to talk about today, and that is this letter here. So this is a letter written to Congress, Congress of the United States. Thank you to one of the subscribers who sent this to me. And it was written on June 29th, 2022. Now, this is a really big deal. We're going to go to the shared screen so you can actually follow along and read this with me. But it's all to do with the deteriorating food supply in the United States. And actually, it is a lot worse than most of you think. And it's always interesting. I still remember a year or two years ago. In fact, it's about a year, year and a half ago now where so many because 55% of my subscribers are American. So many said, Neil, you're wrong on this one. There is absolutely no way we're going to have food difficulties in the United States. I don't care what, you know, a lot of these comments are quite interesting, not trolling comments because, you know, there's a difference between trolling and just positive criticism, which I appreciate. So a lot of people said there'll never be food problems in the US because we have you know, self-sufficiency with energy production. So, you know, diesel and, and fuel at the pumps never going to be super expensive. Well, that's reversed. We, you know, have all this uh, fertilizer. We have all this fertile farmland. So there's no problems. Well, yes, but what else have you got at the moment? Huge droughts throughout a lot of states. And I'll prove that to you in a moment. And also the fertilizer issue. And this is what this letter is about. Let me go to the shared screen, actually. And let's actually go over this letter because it is crucial. Now, after we've gone over this letter, I'm going to show you all the states and everything else that's happened with uh, train derailments of fertilizer and all this sort of things going on, all this crazy stuff, to be honest. Uh, OK, so here it is. On behalf of our constituents and farmers around the country, so this is the United States of America, we write regarding poor rail service which has limited fertilizer shipments among other essential agricultural inputs and commodities, including grain and feed. At a time when global fertilizer supplies and global crop production are highly disrupted, uh, for the reasons I just mentioned, imposing shipping curtailments on fertilizer inputs and grain, as recently proposed by Union Pacific, which is a, a railway company, will cause major supply chain disruptions hurt American farmers and exacerbate the food crisis considerably. So again, they are now identifying that the USA has a food crisis. According to the Fertilizer Institute, over half of all fertilizer moves by rail and recent service problems and imposed restrictions have forced fertilizer shipping reductions and potential production delays. This can restrict fertilizer supply and raise costs on the farmers who rely on this necessary input for 50% of their crop yields. So just think about that, 50% of the yields. Now, I wanna show you this real quick. Crews on scene cleaning up the crash site. 
The derailment happened last night just before 9.30 p.m. Okay, so if you're wondering what is going on here, this was a huge train derailment that occurred. This was potash destined for the United States. And somehow it mysteriously, have a look at this, it derailed. So yet again, another coincidence. Just happened to be this huge shipment of potash destined for the United States and it derailed. Uh, what else then? Feed mills, integrated livestock and poultry operations and other agricultural operations are also experiencing pervasively poor rail service. This has led to shutdowns and slowdowns at ethanol plants, soybean crushers, flour mills and livestock and poultry feed mills that are severely challenging agricultural supply chain and leading to lower prices for producers and higher food prices for consumers. Now, do you remember what we talked about before with wheat pricing and soybeans as well? This is on trading economics. This is the soybean pricing. Look at this. Can you actually see what's happened over the last, well, in fact, let's look here. Let's go to a five-year chart here. This is back in, what do we have, 2019. So before all of this happened, this is where the lockdown periods happened, remember? So everything was fine before then. And all of a sudden now, you have these very high feed costs. You also have very high costs throughout all of your other uh, food-based commodities. Now, what are these 40 states that are experiencing drought at the moment then? Well, this is only moderate drought. So these are all the states that is moderate, severe and moderate drought. Uh, we have these states here and then moderate, severe and extreme. So Iowa, Nebraska is a big one we keep hearing about, Wyoming, Hawaii, Idaho. And then this one also includes exceptional droughts. Oklahoma, Texas, Colorado, Kansas, Montana, Oregon, California, Nevada, Utah, Arizona, New Mexico. So some of the people last year that said we were going to have this major problem then in these states, we're not lying and we're not incorrect after all. Those people said that there was gonna be severe drought this year and now it is here. It's affecting the southern half, I would say, of the United States in terms of those states and this will affect crop yields this year. You also have the other big problem which is your um, diesel fuel. The, the cost on diesel fuel is just astronomical now. And so many people, again, a year ago said, well, what does it matter? It doesn't affect me in any way. How's it going to affect farming? Well, as I've, you know, the joke I've made before, combine harvesters, they don't run on, you know, they don't have solar panels on top of them. They don't have electric batteries. It's not like having an electric car. These things uh, require a huge amount of energy input via diesel fuel uh, in, in the most part for most of these machinery. The majority of it is diesel fuel. What about the truckers? What about all of the processing plants and, and all this? This is all input energy costs, which are through the roof. The other pattern we've seen, again, this is a historical pattern, is that whenever there are times of plenty, which was 2020 and also going into 2021, why was it a time of plenty, you might wonder, because of excess liquidity and stimulus and a lot of new currency creation. What tends to happen is that workers leave the workforce. And this isn't just what's happened in this period. You can trace this back hundreds, if not thousands of years, people leave the workforce. And this goes back to the 1300 when you had these um, plagues going through the world, you know, the Black Death and the, the Black Plague as, it's, as they were known. Workers started to demand up to three times the salary they were earning beforehand because you know, wiped out 50% of, of the population in some areas. Now, the difference in this period versus that period is you haven't had 50% of the population wiped out by COVID. It's actually a, a, a tiny, tiny uh, percentage. In fact, it's less than 1%. So why are we having this same sort of leveling effect? And why is this going into food and all the other things? Well, I believe that a lot of it is a deliberate destruction of the food supply. And we actually have a lot of the evidence for this now via the reports I put out on ESG and the mandates and the like. And we also have, now you're seeing these farming protests, uh, especially we've talked about the Netherlands, the Dutch farmers who are still protesting at the moment. 
there's just no way they can reduce their livestock by 10 million or more in the speed that the Dutch government have asked them to. There's no way that some areas can reduce their nitrogen-based fertilizers by 95%. And of course, who wants to come in and buy the farmland, <laughs> right? When you start connecting all these dots together, it's not a coincidence. So what are they saying then? Therefore, the ability for the fertilizer and grain and feed industries to ship by rail is imperative for curbing the impending food shortages many parts of the world are facing. So they're basically saying, look, we need to do this now to avoid this hitting America. For these reasons, timely and uninterrupted fertilizer and grain rail shipments are vital to the country's interest. Reports last month regarding Union Pacific directing fertilizer producers to reduce shipment on the eve of the spring application season are therefore troubling. Yeah, that's uh, one word I'd, I'd use to describe it. Union Pacific also curbed grain shipments leading to supply chain interruptions. If other carriers follow Union Pacific's example from this past spring, we could see supply chain inconsistencies creep into full production as well. Now here's quite a bold statement. By placing onerous restrictions on shippers without customer consultation, class one carriers may run the risk of jeopardizing family run farms Oh, what a surprise. And increasing the cost of food for consumers. If Union Pacific continues down this path and other carriers follow suit, it will reduce crop production at a time when our nation and the world can least afford it. Now, I just wanted to show you something that I was trying to find actually and, and struggling to find it, but I did find it via a Google search, which I don't often like using Google. But this image here shows the famine that actually existed in ancient Egypt. And you can see it's quite a haunting stone carving that we have here. And you can see the rib cages of these Egyptians. And this is quite interesting. The Egyptians viewed food deprivation as a liminal experience approaching chaos. So we've got these records further back than 2180 BC actually. But even here, even ancient Egypt's mighty pyramid builders were powerless in the face of famine that helped bring down their civilization around 2180 BC. Now evidence gleaned from mud deposited by the River Nile suggests that a shift in climate, okay, so we had climate change back then, thousands of kilometers to the south was ultimately to blame and the same or worse could happen today. Now I wanna just show you all of these examples of climate change that occurred way before all of the um, CO2 emissions and everything that's you know, tr being tried to bring down at the moment. Another one, this was a different period, this was 2700 BC in Egypt. A shortage of the Nile flood in 2700 BC led to a seven year famine, leaving Egypt in a state of extreme distress. The king was perplexed as grains were insufficient, seas dried up, people robbed each other, and temples and shrines closed. Looking for an end to his people's suffering, the king consulted his architect and prime minister, Imhotep, commanding him to dig for a solution in the old sacred texts. Now, interestingly, this was, uh, if you ever saw the film, The Mummy, this was that who the mummy was, Imhotep. Let's move over to Angkor Wat then, which I've actually been to in Siam Reap, Cambodia. It is definitely, definitely worth going to. Um, again, they talk about drought. History suggests that Cambodia had several drought crises in the 13th, 14th, 15th centuries. So again, this is cyclical in nature. These droughts kept mounting fresher challenges to tackle for the people of Angkor Wat. While the ruling elite did do their best to develop and maintain a highly efficient water system in those times, it just wasn't enough to save them from feeling the ill effects of the drought. The most significant droughts to have affected the Angkor Wat population came during the 14th and 15th century, which led to total water system failure, leading to a mass exodus of people from the city. Again, what are we seeing in California right now? We are seeing a, not quite a, a total water failure, but we're definitely on the way to it. And it's not just in California that we're seeing this. We're seeing this in other states as well. Look at Lake Mead. If you're not aware, Lake Mead is drying up. And the interesting thing about this, and especially with the water tables around, a year ago when, when I actually, if you remember, I went out to America, I filmed some videos and things. 
I said when I did that Q&A, people asked, why don't you want to move to you know, Las Vegas or why don't you want to stay in Southern California? I said, because there is going to be a problem with the water. There's going to be drought conditions. I also did the, the video, if you recall, on the semiconductor chips. And I said, why are all of these factories setting up in Arizona when you're going to have a water uh, problem, shortages as it were, and my, uh, semiconductor microchip factories need huge amounts of fresh water. Do you honestly think when the choice is between giving the people the water or these semiconductor chip factories, who do you think the government's going to give the water to? They're going to give it to the, the companies because this is how it always happens. Just look at what was announced, uh, I think it was today or yesterday with Uber. And Uber had paid off all of these politicians, high ranking officials, um, prime ministers and all sorts of you know, leaders and politicians in high levels. All of this, is, and I don't understand why so many people are surprised when all of this keeps coming out. This is what these people do. This is what these politicians are in power for. They're in power to make money. Okay, last example then is Chichen Itza. So if you don't know, this was in sort of the Mayan Empire region. Three major intervals of drought are identified between AD 820 and 1100. So that's less than 100 years per drought. Two waves of collapse are identified AD 850 to 925 and AD 1000 to 1050. Chichen Itza dominated the political landscape of the northern Utican during the terminal classic period of 800 to 1000 AD. So again, I just want to highlight the fact that I don't believe these drought periods that we are seeing, and we're seeing this all over the world at the moment, we're seeing drought in some areas, flooding in other areas. I don't believe this is just a result of, of climate change, as we keep being told all the time. The evidence is here. You only have to look at all of the charts, you only have to look through history, and you can see these periods of drought are very common, and they keep happening all over, uh, over and over again. And the advice throughout these history books is quite simple. Store grain when the time is good, or you know the expression, make hay while the sun is shining. You want to store your grains for later on when these sort of drought periods, when flooding and things like that ruined your crops. Do we do that these days? No. We have a JIT supply chain system just in time. And unfortunately, it seems as though we're never going to learn. And I don't even know if this coming food crisis, well, it's not coming anymore, it's here. I guess the next thing would be uh, more likely famine in some areas. I don't even think this is going to teach the leaders. They never seem to learn. They, in fact, they prefer to throw away history than study history these days. So that was just an update from me today in terms of food, in terms of what I'm seeing at the moment with the food crisis. I've already explained numerous times what you should be doing at this point, making sure you've got your long life food. I hope you have done that by now. If not, you know, what else can I say? But thanks so much for watching today. I'll see you tomorrow for the Friday walk and talk video. Until then, take care. God bless. See you soon.